is nine, recording in progress. So uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody to another one of our Global Futures Laboratory special seminars on ocean related topics. I see that people are getting excited about it. Uh, yesterday, Vicky actually decided she wants to become an oceanographer. So I'm wondering who will be the next one who will convert from what they are doing right now to oceanography. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Leo Blanco Bercial, who will talk about new tools for understanding the ocean's diversity. <clears throat> Leo is presently an associate scientist at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, and he is by training or by acquired knowledge, a zooplankton ecologist who has investigated zooplankton community at the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series typically known as BATS site in the Sargasso Sea. He received his PhD from the University of Oviedo, where he studied plankton ecology and population dynamics in the Cantabrian Sea. I was, was here to say that the Caribbean Sea, but it's the no. Cantabrian Sea. So before that, before moving to BIOS, Leo was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Connecticut, where he began investigating the spatial and temporal patterns of genetic variation in marine organisms. And of course, all of that is related to understanding how these ecosystems change with the environmental pressure we are putting onto them. So with that, I would like to ask Leo to come to the podium and start his presentation. Thank you very much. and like two, two hours. All right, so thank you very much for coming to my talk. And before I start, I would like to, so, to thank my, the lab. So these are the research assistants. We have Hannah, Kevin, and, and Jess. So they are the ones that are taking the data, the samples we have at sea, then doing all the analysis, what is what extraction DNA, et cetera, and give us the data so we can do the analysis and what are the papers, okay? But there is a, it's not only the PIs, actually, we have also a strong team behind, like, holding us. So, well, you introduced me. So, yes, I'm from North Spain. That's why I have this Spanish accent. I try to soften, but I cannot. I'm sorry. And um, I did my PhD, I did my PhD in Spain, but then I did my, my postdoc at University of Connecticut in what was in the uh, Marine life barcoding effort, et cetera, funded by Sloan. <coughs> and then finally, I was research assistant professor. Uh, what happens there is that then you can write proposals. And finally, I moved into BIOS in 2015 as assistant scientist. Uh, my research lines basically are about phylogenetics and evolution in one group of plankton, the copepods, that are the most important consumers in the ocean. Uh, population genetics also as a tool for adaptation, as a way for adaptation to, to the changes in the ocean. And finally, community ecology and diversity. And today I'm going to present most data from this uh, third point, basically because we, we are now uh, especially funded by NSF. And introducing first diversity, I understand diversity from this biodiversity concept of frozen and others. And it's a variety of different types of life found on Earth. This is the definition by United Nations in 2010, and it's the one that appears, for example, in Wikipedia. So it's there. And they took several, several authors and they tried to basically condense all the different concepts of biodiversity from physiology, ecology, et cetera. And, and something important to communicate is why is this important? Why is biodiversity and why would we keep biodiversity in the world? And it's because ecosystems that are providing us what we call services. Okay, so from tourism, fisheries, pharmacology, these are basically economic, direct economic impacts in, in nations, especially, for example, in <clears throat> island nations like Bermuda. Also, they provide, for example, stability facing challenging conditions, what is called the resilience. So for the same kind of biome, we know now that more diverse communities, they are more resilient to changes. So if we are facing challenge by climate change, they say, actually those with high diversity, they will be able to, to be in front, to resist that changes uh, easier. And we know also they are more beautiful. No? The idea is this research was very interesting for the same bi biome. Again, you cannot compare 
deserts and forests. But if you take the same kind of forest, actually people perceive those forests with higher diversity as more beautiful. So there is something in, in our evolutionary brain that is telling us that biodiversity actually is important and we perceive it as beautiful. And when we measure them, however, when we go, in, when we go into the science, nowadays uh, there are many ways to measure the biodiversity. And these are three of the main components, taxonomic, phylogenetic, and functional diversity. Mm -hmm. So going one by one, the taxonomic diversity is the easiest way, the, the easiest one to understand. Yes. It's just the species number. Okay, so you have a community with three species. This is more diverse than a community that has two species. So that's pretty straightforward. But this is assuming that all the species are equal in an ecosystem. See, they all have the same way. And, and we don't know if that is true, or now we know that it's not true. So we were trying to find ways to measure those differences. How do we know if they are different? How do we measure these, these differences? An easy way is that phylogenetic diversity. One of the screens died. It's back. Ah, it's back, all right. Perfect. So phylogenetic, and this the concept is that in communities with the same, same number of species, the community that have more diverse phylogenetic lineages, if they will be more diverse. For example, here we have two bony fish, the Goliath cougar <clears throat> and the lionfish and a bird. And here we have a horse, the horse that lives under my parents' house, the, the tropic bird from Bermuda and the Goliath. So here, two bony fish, one bird, one bony fish, one bird, we mama. So then we have three very evolutionary lineages. Then this will be more diverse. And, and what the phylogenetic diversity was trying to capture is that when you do have two species that are related to each other, they're going to share a lot of what we call the functional traits. That is the role they have in the community, some affinities, some metabolic pathways, et cetera. That is what define the role in the ecosystem, things that are going to affect their fitness. And what happens is that when two species that are very related, they're going to share a common ancestor. And that is going to give you some constraints, some thresholds in what you can be, in what can you have within your life cycle of life tweets. <clears throat> okay. And that then is the last concept that I was talking about, that is the functional diversity. That is what is some kind of function that we define as important or we're interested. And we can establish then levels within those, that function, those traits, and then analyze it. For example, if we're looking at trophic diversity here in the right brain, we will have the Molayal grouper that is a top predator, a lion, another top predator, and a mesopredator, as is the tropic bird. In this other one, we have top predator, mesopredator, herbivore. Despite that, from the phylogenetic point of view, they are equal. We have a mammal, fish, uh, bird. This one will have a higher trophic diversity. All right? So again, the trick of, of functional diversity is that depends on what we think that is relevant. So it's then scientist bias, isn't it? And we have to define the traits that we're interested, the levels, and then we measure that. For example, the trophic position, or, or in the protists that, that Gillian and Susanna are studying, they are autotrophs, heterotrophs, or mixotrophs. All right. So then we put, we can establish those levels. Now we are studying in the protist how many different kinds of mixotrophy they have. All right. So then it's a subjective measure because we put the levels. So sometimes you will think this community is more diverse than this other one. And other scientists might have a different idea just because it's looking at different things. All right. So today, then we have to say, why, why do we want to measure all these different, instead of just staying with the, which one has more species or, or one of the easier ones? Why do we want to complicate the thing? And, and it's because we have to always keep in mind, what are we trying to preserve from an ecosystem? Are we trying to preserve all these species? Or are we trying to, to keep the services, the stability, et cetera, because those is going to depend on the, function, the functionality of the ecosystem. And sometimes in a, in a single ecosystem for, for one action that you need to keep, you might have several species doing the same thing. And this is called the redundancy. How many species you have doing, you are doing the same 
role in that ecosystem because maybe for that particular role, you can lose a few species or one or two and the ecosystem, the integrity of it is going to stay. It's not going to change. So the important is to know which are the ones that actually they don't have anybody to replace them. Because if we lose those, then it's when the ecosystem can move to a different state. I'm not saying the ecosystem is going to disappear, but it's true that it's going, it might move to a different state. So then which are the are possible ones in our ecosystems? And to which are the conditions the environmental conditions that are keeping the ecosystem as it is. So today, we need to show a biodiversity hotspot that is the plankton, and to be precise, the zooplankton, the animal plankton. So within the animal plankton, we have 16 phyla. Phyla is uh, uh, one of the higher ranks in, in the life when we try to classify organisms. And basically they're basing, let's say, their body, body model. So arthropods is a phyla, mollus is a phyla. And most marine animals are plankton at some stage, not the mammals, not most of the sharks. But when we think about corals, when we think about, uh, I don't know, clams, even these guys, they have a planktonic stage. Is the egg or the larvae, they are going to be floating in the ocean. Apart from the animals that they are all the time, they spend all their life floating, that is the plant. They are in every water mass. So if you go to your canal, the spider looks like that. I'm sure that you take samples of the water and the benthos, and you're going to have plenty of life, and you're going to have plants on their living. So you, to, you go to, the, I don't know, the mountain in the, in the rock is up there, a small lake that is plankton. And the plankton, something that happens that is key in the global biochemical cycle. So how they carbon and nitrogen, how they flow through the oceans, they are the key part between linking the photosynthesis and fish. Okay, so basically, the zooplankton they are going to feed in these primary producers, the one fixing the CO two, and they are going to then move it uh, higher in the trophic level or deeper into the ocean. And the plankton then has a high taxonomic, phylogenetic, and functional diversity. So we can find hundreds and hundreds of species per sample from this kind of 16 phyla and doing many different things from just feeding in phytoplankton to being very highly specialized super carnivores feeding in other sort of plankton. So how do we measure this that is not painful anymore? Because I did it in my, in doing, when I was a PhD, I did my PhD looking in the microscope and I promise you that at night, those in, during those years, when I was closing my eyes to go to sleep, I will just see plates of copy pots that I was counting during the day. So I don't do that anymore. <clears throat> so then that's why, and this is a nice title I have, that is the plankton diversity in the high throughput era. So in this slide, that is all the so plankton animals. These pictures were taken by a, a professional photographers that came to one of our census of marine life cruises. But a couple of slides, the ones that have like a gray background, they're mine. <laughs> and but actually here you have uh, um, anelids, you have nidaria, you have arthropods, keto nuts are a very marine uh, group, you have mollusks, you have also even chordates, so these are all cousins there. <laughs> you have this the many different phyla and, and just a single tank in top. I'm going to talk about the salt plankton where I'm working, as Peter said, in the Sagasso Sea. But before I saw my data, when I started to, to read all the literature from Sargasso that started in the 30s, uh, this, I want to show this excerpt from Divi, Georgiana Divi working in Bermuda in the 60s and Paris. What I think they are the last taxonomic or, or population dynamics papers really in following a species in the Sargasso. And it's a, because of the taxonomic problems and amount of time that would have been involved, I'm familiar with that. Nothing has it made to identify management species of such genera as, for example, para, clausus, spinocaranus, microcaranus, these names are strange, very familiar to me. And also, some larger species were not identified. And 75, more than 300 species, was just one order, panacopetos. But this, that I know, these groups, this is telling me these two phrases. That basically, C might have identified about 25% of the species present in the sargasso. All the others, C didn't have time 
to do it. And this is still the case, right? This is a picture I took from, actually I took a scoop of my sample, put it there, put it in the microscope and, and took the picture, all right? This guy here is called Peron Masifias. Amy Mas gave a talk last week and she talked about this guy. Uh, this is a female. So, and this is likely one of the most abundant species in the Sargasso. And for sure, it's one of the main components of the biomass. And in this picture, is the only one of that species, all right? We have here, for example, a coral larvae. This is a larvae of octocoral. You can see that have like eight, eight globes. And amphipod, these are actually uh, worms related to basically the earthworms, uh, polychids. And of all the others that you see there, likely maybe a few of them they are repeated, but most of them they are the single individuals of that species in this picture. And this was just a random one. If you take another scoop and you put it there, Likely most of the species are going to be new. All right. This is my life. <laughs> but due to this, that's why there were not so many studies during, not even in the BATS program that started in the 90s that Peter introduced, or that previous program is called Hydro Station from the 60s, is closer to, to the coast. And in the 60s and the 70s, there was some about biomass or carbon flux, so more like processes evolving, not about community ecology. There was some image-based analysis, but again, not really looking at what were the, the, the process in the community, but yes, what some chosen groups, what is the reaction to the environment? And some questions about export cycles, but again, nothing about the community. This is your more biomass or one or two species. So what we are doing now, that is one of the sources of high throughput data, is we are using molecular tools to assess what is the community composition, right? So what do we do is we take this sample of animals, I put it in a tube and I use a, a blender that is a fancy $800 laboratory blender, but it's a blender, right? So we grind everything there in the lysis buffer, we extract the DNA from there, and then we analyze one small fragment from one gene of everything that is there, of that mix of DNA for everything that is there, right? And we sequence all of that, we get millions of reads, and from there, after some bioinformatic analysis and comparing to the databases, we can get taxonomic IDs and uh, relative abundances of what is there. So basically, we get the community composition of each species. And start asking ourselves some questions. For example, is there a seasonal cycle in the Sargasso Sindes or Blanton community? Is this seasonal cycle linked to biochemical cycles? Does it have any impact? And this looks like a very basic question that, that you, you might think that this has to have been solved, and it was not. <clears throat> we are in a so the Sargasso Sea is a subtropical environment. Uh, our seasons are weak, basically. If you go there, you might think that we have basically a fall and a summer or a spring and a summer. The ocean, we have some mixing and then we then the, then the, the water masses up to 200 meters are completely homogeneous with surface. And there is high temperatures mm -hmm. that create a gradient in surface that then separates, it's called the stratification. So then the densities are too different. These two water masses, the surface and below don't mix. But still the differences, they are not that dramatic compared to, for example, the Gulf of Maine or any other temperate ocean, right? So the first thing that I did was let's compare this taxonomic diversity, number of species with something very easy like carbon export. Here on the left axis, this is carbon export, carbon flux to the ocean. So how much carbon goes, is fixed in the ocean and then is exported to the deep. That is a way to remove carbon from the atmosphere that by natural processes. Yet, and please notice that this is a logarithmic scale. So we have this huge peak in March, and then we enter through the year goes to a low, and this is especially low at the end of December. And on the right hand, that is the broken line, is the number of species per month. And there is not a real, a good correlation, isn't it? We have a very high at the beginning of the year during the winter, and actually the export is pretty low here, maximum after the diversity is going down, and then keeps going up and down, up and down. 
and doesn't look to be affected by this minimum export at the end of the year compared to the number of species that we have. And so we don't see a good link between taxonomic species. But again, this is a very brute way to, to analyze things and think that all the species are the same. So we can do a more complex analysis. So here on the left, we have a, a two-dimensional representation of all the samples that I had in by month, also they are taking day or night. And the closer two points are, the more similar the communities are going to be. All right. So this is called a non-dimensional, uh, uh, non-metric multidimensional scale. So, and then also statistically, we can infer if we have different clusters. Basically, sample is in a cluster if it's closer to the other samples in that group than to any other uh, group of samples. All right. And what we have here is that we have four seasons. We have here in black, we have the, the what will be the winter, spring, summer, and fall, right? And actually this has a good correlation with what we see in the hydrography. So when the water is fully mixed to the deep, the top, the top 200 meters, then we have a quite, this is this group. When water starts to warm up and we start to have this surface slightly warmer, this is temperature representing temperatures so slightly yellow. We were then switching to what will be the spring and early summer, the two most war the warmest months, that is uh, August and September, this is a different community. There the water is highly stratified. That means that the difference in, in density between the surface water and the one below 50 meter is so different. Actually, the, the transfer of nutrients even is almost null. And then in the fall with the storms, et cetera, there's, kind of, there's some mixing, the water starts to cool down. It will start to mix with the deeper water that is colder. And we have then a difference of antique community. And something interesting that I found is that when you compare these relationships with uh, a similar analysis done with the exporting flux of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, that are the three main uh, components of the export. So basically carbon, because it's what makes us and it's what is in CO2, but also nitrogen and phosphorus, the two nutrients that controls primary production in the ocean, we find that there is a correlation between these guys. So why? Um, an easy way to do it is like, who is in each of these groups? So then we have here a few pictures of them. These groups that is Chloromacifias that Amy talked about, the krill, the krill that the whales go to eat to New England, but also some, we have many species in the, in the group of Maine and appendicularias, that is a relative that we have, is a coordinate. They are related to the high flux moment. So these two guys, they are large. The pleuromacifias is about three millimeters. This that is large for being a, a plankton. Krill is a multi-centimeter animal. And these are very strong swimmers. They will go up, feed very fast, whatever is in surface, create large fecal pellets that then they will go down in the water column. So this creating this high export of carbon because they are sending a lot of material into the deep ocean. <clears throat> Appendicularians, these relatives that we have actually, they are very small, but they have a particularity that they create a house of cellulose. So this is animal cellulose actually. So not only plants create cellulose and they make this house of cellulose that they inflate and they feed them filtering plankton. And at some point when all the filters close, they get rid of that house create a new one, but then that house is going to go to the deep ocean. And it's cellulose, and one of the characteristics of the cellulose is that it's very resilient to degradation by bacteria. That's why the plants have it. Right. So then those houses are going to sink in the ocean after it create it's a significant flux of what we measure. Right. Then later in the year, when there is less production and there's food, we have these large copepods that they don't migrate that much. They have a slower, um, let's say, life cycle. So they're still large, they have some export, but it's not going to be as strong as the other ones. And when we move to these poor months of high stratification, the community is dominated by very, very small so planters, very transparent, that is in very small cells, that is what it can be found there, or some small carnivores that are actually like leather and feeding on them. And in the part of less, Export, what we have here is like a tiny one with Zona. There is a paper in 2000 that the title was, is Zona the most important uh, copepod in the world? 
It's, a, it's very small, it's about like 0 0.5, 2 0.8 millimeters, but it's so abundant that in these cases in, in which we have very low production, very small cells in the phytoplankton, very little nutrients, they are able to feed on them. They can feed in bacteria, actually. And what we have with them is deep sea migrators that actually will likely be feeding on them. But what we have is here, is a highly recycled environment that is from the phytoplankton is eaten by a zooplankton, but this zooplankton is eaten by other zooplankton or is feeding on the, they try to sort that one. So we have what is called a, a high recycle level. What happens every time that you recycle a particle, a lot of the carbon is lost, respired. It's back to be CO2. So it doesn't keep moving down. It's just respired there and then there's an equilibrium with the atmosphere. So here then, if we remember, we have the peak, then with these guys, they produce a lot of uh, flux because they produce, uh, they produce large particles. And then it goes decreasing to these yeah. other guys that they are not as good as, this, as that. And it gets this minimum where we have the highest point of recycling, all right? So then using both molecular, but also image analysis, we're able to find why what is the, the seasonal cycle and what is the impact of that seasonal cycle in the ocean, all right? So then we were getting this uh, functional diversity and this we get it through image analysis. It was very tedious with the microscope, but now we use the semi-automatic methods. Okay, we combine the scanning and some machine learning. So the scanning, basically this is HANA or technician putting a sample in this uh, soil scan and he's going to put all the animals there and they're going to be perfectly spread so they don't touch each other. Then we're going to scan this image at 4,800 dpi and so process is the software that's going to take every of each, every individual is going to take it, separate it from the others, create a whole a vignette. And it's going to take some more for life measurements. So how long, how width, is dark, is light, whatever. And also we're going to send all this data into a machine learning uh, web tool in which thanks to a, a training set that I spent created that identifying images from animal, then we run and we can, we can get this large taxa group classification. So then we have some morphometrics and then some uh, taxa, taxonomic group classification. And then we can start analyzing those things about function. Why are we interested in size in morphometrics? Because actually, in size depends many of the ecosystem functioning. That is uh, physiology, which is the size of, which is the relationship with, between prey and predators, etc. The analysis of uh, another yearly cycling bat, but using images, but it's the same as in the previous one. So we scan and process, we only pick copy pods. This is important. Why only copy pods? Because we can, I can have a better phylogenetic placement. So I have a very good tree of copy pods that then I can take the copy pod sequences and put them in that tree. And that is going to give me another measurements that is about phylogenetic shifts between communities. I'm not going to talk about it. We have better functional databases. There's a lot of people working in things like um, do males feed when they are adults? For example, it's down spot, but actually it's very important. How they, do they lay eggs? Do they release it to the ocean or they take care of the eggs? and things like that, herbivores, omnivores, et cetera. And also is to constrain evolutionary processes to a single lineage. And this is causing less noise. I will talk a little bit later about it. But basically, if you put different animals in the same ecosystem, sometimes two different lineages converge to the same morphotype, just because they are doing the same thing in the ecosystem. Is it or one or something similar in the ecosystem? For example, uh, bats, and birds, they both fly and they both have wings. All right. So the same happens with other monkeys. <clears throat> and this is a job. Uh, so Margot Spehiri is a master's student from the Sorbonne University in Paris, and I'm co-advising her master's. So she's doing this research as part of her second uh, chapter. So here I represented a PCA. I will explain that basing all these match measurements I'm doing. A PCA is a way to simplify or to, to summarize the variability that we have in all the measurements into a two-dimensional space. All right, so now we have here 
this axis is going to explain about 42% of the variability that we find in all the morphometrics. And this is the other axis explains about 27. That is pretty good because between the two of them, we get almost a 70% of the variability explained. And these are the different morphometrics that we use that are highly correlated. And what this is telling me is that basically large animals are going to be here, the smaller are going to be here, and then um, dark animals, dark in this kind of going to be in this area, and light in animals are going to be here. All right. And then you combine these two, you might be able to place everything. I also uh, we identify the centroid of each plant. Okay, so when you put the animals for each month, they need to be distributed on a cloud, and we put the centroid, and then we ask the software if can identify different clusters. And what we have here is then three seasons. We have uh, winter and or late fall and winter, or it will be a spring, and this will be uh, basically uh, summer, summer and fall. So we have only three seasons. We have four. So there are some discrepancies between the two of them, between the molecular data and the images. I'm okay with that. We'll see what is going on uh, later in her, in her dissertation. But what about carbon export and what we'll see in taxonomy? This is the same graph, but we have overrepresented the pictures of the animals in each of these clouds. All right. <clears throat> and this red line indicates what is the relationship between this distribution and carbon export. So this is telling me that carbon export is maximum during when we have large and dark individuals. It doesn't correspond exactly with the months because March is down here, so it doesn't follow the same thing. But if you remember, the animals we have during the large uh, export, there were these kind of big guys, Pleromama, there was big, dark, that Amy was showing, right? And then low export is related to small, uh, very transparent individuals. So, okay, at least we agree on that. We have high export, we have large and dark individuals that are doing this migration. But then this is one of the parts that is to be a little philosophical is that export related to opaque and large individuals or not. Because the same like, can you give me the video please? Export, so how the carbon goes down, relates is a balance between production of these products and attenuation, that is the consumption of the falling particles. Here we have an ostracod, this case of one millimeter. And it's eating actually a particle that was being created and is what send the, the ones that export it. It's going around. This reminds, reminds me when I give my children a sandwich and they start to open the sandwich and eat all the inside. Mm -hmm. I don't eat the outside. And at the end they give it to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so this guy is doing this thing. He's going around and he's avoiding the black part. If you see, he's only eating the, the I suppose, delicious red brown thing. <laughs> at some point, so the mouth of these animals is there. At some point you will see how the volus goes into the stomach. And it's trying to avoid all the all this black thing. I suppose I don't know what could be that looks like doesn't taste well. Then there it goes. I can be watching this video and loop for hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then basically these guys, there it goes, all to the stomach. At some point, it's going to eat one of the black parts, it's going to like it, and after a couple of rounds, it's going to discard everything. I'm going to keep talking. So then, but these guys then are reducing the export. So then there's the balance of who are these attenuators? Who is doing this role? This, this guy basically is keeping these flux. They are very transparent, small, like the guys that we have, we have low float, low flux. So then why, what is happening? We have low production, high attenuation, or both. And this is part of the grant that we are having now, uh, this and for last year and next two years with Susanna Neuer. And I hope that we can show more data soon. Last part of my research, I need to be short, is about constraints in evolutionary components, also from this image data. Okay. And this is part of a large NSF grant that we have to compare the North Atlantic and the North Pacific copperwood community. And we're interested about who, which are the environmental drivers in plankton diversity and distribution in the North Atlantic. So basically, here we have a gradient in the North Atlantic from south to north, and in the Pacific from south to north, like equatorial to North Atlantic, no, sorry, equatorial to North Pacific. And what we see in oxygen is that the North Atlantic is fully oxic. So basically the oxygen levels, I think is 200 to 20, and you have it everywhere to 1000 meters is fully oxic, there is no problem. 
fully oxygenated. When in the Pacific, in the North Pacific, these waters, these deep waters are very old. They have been submerged without contact with the atmosphere for thousands of years. And all the oxygen has been consumed basically by bacterial respiration. Okay. And, and we're interested in comparing both because in the present state of or the present change, one of the ideas is that these uh, oxygen minimum zones are going to be expanding. And actually, maybe new oxygen minimum zones are going to appear in the ocean. So we need to understand what are the processes controlling these ecosystems compared to these ecosystems to maybe predict what is going to happen. All right. And part of the another master student, she, uh, Rocio, is from Argentina, but she's a student at Princeton University in Amsterdam. And uh, she came for six months to my lab, also she decided to stay five more months, this is great. And we're going to focus in copper pots, just one evolutionary lineage. But when I started to look at her data, there were a few things that didn't convince me. So I decided to make this question, are, different, are there difference between the two dominant groups of copper pots? So in the ocean, we have two groups, the calanoids that are the copper pots that have been for longer in the ocean, is the copper pot that appears in the sponge pot, for example, plankton. And these guys are from the Ordovisic, and they basically the winners of the plant or the soap plankton nowadays. Then we have another group, cyclopoids. These are more modern, a few later, and they have different lifestyles. They are smaller and, and they are more specialized. Actually, some of them are diving parasitic. So we're going to compare both and what happens with the vertical distribution in the surpolar North Pacific. Remember, there is a strong oxygen level. Explain this slide, don't worry. <laughs> okay, let's focus first here. Yes, it's calanoida, all right? And I have this PCA, so the same structure before. I'm trying to summarize the, the variability in a, in a two-dimensional plot. And here we have the, the, the individuals came from the day and here from the night. These animals, they migrate, they go up and down in the water column. I explained that last week. And uh, the important part is that if we have an animal that was in surface during the night and the bottom during the day, it doesn't matter for this to be safe because the animal is going to be the same. It has the same shape, it's dark, so it's going to be in the same spatial point. And by color, I have represented that from blue in depth to red in the deep. All right. And similar to the previous one, on the right, they are going to be large individuals. And well, here in the top is going to be actually transparent individuals, and here they're going to be darker individuals. All right. So then we have large, dark, uh, light, small, transparent. The first thing that I see is that there are many different groups of copper pots. There's a cloud, another cloud. Most of them they are these smallish animals, okay? But there are some trends that you see some different groups. But then if we play, pay attention to the colors, we see that they are darker, they are redder, closer to the surface at night. But I can see different groups and I'm going to go through them. In red, we have some group that in, they move from being very blue or 600 meters to being strong in the surface, in the very surface, all right? So these are the guys that are coming to, to, to the surface. Something interest, interesting if you go there is actually there's not a single group of copepals. There are actually two very different evolutionary lineages of copepals, <laughs> basically the most ancient and the, some of the most of the newest one from the evolutionary point of view that they converge both in the morphometrics, but also in one of the important traits in their lives. That is, if they change the position, the vertical column during the day and during night. All right. So this is a very interesting converging <coughs> evolutionary uh, tree. The other thing that happened here is that these guys, you see that in the surface, they don't change much, but also here there's a mix between some of them that stay always in surface and some they migrate, there's a mix. But the important, there's some very curious part for me or very interesting, is this large and dark animals that they are all the time in surface. Also, some of them migrate. Actually, there are all the two loops there, but the guys that stay always in surface, they are the big, dark. Dark is that they are very muscular. That's where they are opaque. And apparently is that if you are dark enough, big enough, and you're muscular enough, you can escape from predators. So you can just stay in surface if you want. So this is what happens with copper pots. All the thing that, with calanoids, sorry. All the thing that happens is that they are everywhere. So they don't have a strong relationship with environmental parameters. They can be everywhere they want. In cyclopoids, these small guys that come after, you see that they're actually 
really more concentrated in a single line. So it's suggesting that actually they have some constraints that they are grouped together. They don't have this kind of different cloud going anywhere. And they are highly organized between transparent small individuals in surface here with large or dark individuals in deep. So that are a clear trade-off between the depth at which you can live your size and how thick you are. So this is a, a strong predator pressure on you that force you to have one of these traits. You have to balance. What do you want to be? Again, they don't have much uh, migration. Also, you might think that this is slightly uh, darker uh, during the night. And something is also interesting is that the relationship with the environmental parameters is much stronger. The correlation of the distribution with environmental parameters is stronger. So what makes me think that one, they are more constrained of where they can live, or that since they don't change much, the depth, they can be more finely tuned to their environment. But those are mostly questions more than answers. So we have all these images that create, and we can do ecology, or we can then create new questions. But for calanoids, then we know there are different profiles instead of size, opacity, they are everywhere, we are more diverse. They have general migration. Also, there is this group. They have some size opacity combination that is the ideal if you want to be a strong migrator. And if you're large enough, you don't need to, to migrate. I think they will be more things, but this is part of Rocio's thesis. Then for cyclopoids, they have this trade-off between depth, size, and opacity. They have more limited profiles. Maybe they are less diverse for in that component. <clears throat> and this continuous distribution might suggest like limited evolution, or maybe more recent. And again, they look to be more finely tuned environment, but maybe that is not, maybe it's just that they just don't want to migrate. So then just to, to pack a little bit over time, my science part, I want to say that high throughput data, then data allows us to, to get a faster understanding of links between the salt planton, hydrography, and the biochemical cycles. We get the direct link between the key players in the community and these carbon exports. We can develop the new hypothesis for new grants that like we have with Susanna, but then we can talk about, that's we going to do a project about eco-evolutionary constraints in size or, or other aspects. And again, this is applicable to other applications, other grants that I don't have time to talk about. It. Six minutes, sorry, a bit. I'm going to be one minute over time. I have left. I want to talk first uh, about broader impacts in science. So I like to escape from the traditional activities in broader impact. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to keep going to the rich neighborhoods and going to the children. I'm going to go to the MIT, bring into my lab, and like, okay, you know everything about this. In BIOS, we have special collaboration with Kelly Noyce, she's the director of research at BIOS and community engagement at the schools. Uh, we have database I'm going to show you. Kaylee Noise is often a co-PI in my NSF grants. So mm -hmm. I prefer to be an API to be a, a P, uh, education person to be directly a PI for my education components because she does a better job than I do, obviously. As part of ASU, we are already exploring the ASUs as a biologist. We're going to try some Zoom galleries, uh, adding to a plant on uh, diversity with these scan images. And we are trying to do a web building, or Yuki, the student is building, a virtual visit of the Atlantic Explorer. This is the boat that we have in BIOS. So we're going to pass one of these 360 cameras, all the boat, and, and as a biologist, they're going to stitch all the images and make a virtual visit. You can put your virtual into Google and walk through the boat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some Twitter collaborations. Um, the first part, Databytes. Databytes is, uh, is part of INSF grant that we have. And then Kaylin with some, with some collaborators that develop these Databytes. There are small amounts of data from orthographic projects that we have. And they create a very condensed or at least precise data that can be used in a teaching environment from high schools to uh, undergrad level, all right? And my work there is provide the data, explain a little bit the story so they can tune it, work with them until make it that everyone can understand it out of jargon from biologists, please. And then I translate the text to Spanish so it's accessible for, for more people. 
Uh, Kaylin is also an organizer and a workshop for high school teachers that are bringing them to Bermuda. And this is in collaboration with the bio, 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 well, Biological and Chemical uh, Oceanography Data Management, for that data management Office of NSA. Okay, so they are in charge, they are also providing the data. These resources are free for everybody. So this is not linked to our project. Data bytes is open. Anybody in the world can access to them. So this is our, our idea of, of fair data, exchangeable, et cetera. Again, the lead is Kaylin. I think she's going to be giving some talks in the during the next BIOS ASU meeting or the ASU meeting at the middle. Something I was doing also, I have this Twitter account and it started as a tool for me to interact with my undergrads, but basically they almost called me boomer and they said that they have Facebook. So I switched to Facebook and I left this Twitter account a little bit there, but then a couple of years, a year and a half ago, more maybe, I decided to, okay, let's give it a shot and try to use it as a tool to get, get our science out, interact with colleagues. Actually, uh, I, I discovered that I was actually uh, to following some of the uh, ASU students and find out what other colleagues are doing. I see even papers coming out, especially during COVID, based in, in Twitter collaborations. And but also you get some unexpected collaborations that they are not academic and without the academic realm. And one of them is video games. Can you click the link? Oops. And you put that in the... <laughs> Thank you. So this is super underwater discoveries. So this is basically uh, as, uh, well, can you, it was okay. No. They're going, it's running. Don't worry. No, leave it, leave it in the, <laughs> yeah. So this is small ROV, this guy, so the, this software developer of, of video game developer, okay, he's a Spanish. So he contacted me through Twitter because he liked what I was posting, the images I was going to see. And he was developing this, this uh, ROV. Basically his idea was like you want to, for example, see whale carcasses, or you have to activate um, science equipment that is in the bottom of the ocean, or go to one of these fumaroles in the, in the Pacific and measure the temperature in this boiling water, et cetera. And when we talked to him, he said, this is a soft temperature. I want it to be pliable. So pliable means that it has to be fun. It has to attract people. It's not about the science. or well, there is science there, but it's about having fun play, all right? But he didn't know anything about oceanography. So then I was like a science advisor explaining how operations happen in sea, in, the, in ships, in the ocean, also, what will be the extinction coefficient for the light? What marine snow will look like when it comes down, et cetera. I was also testing the video games like, okay, you have a problem here, et cetera. And so now we are part of this video game. If can you scroll down to the bottom of the page? Uh, more and more. So now we have the BIOS logo there in Steam. So Steam is one of the main platforms for video game. Um, uh, well, it's basically these so video games. I think that the, the business last year was $4 billion and it's one of the main ones for not big companies, but this kind of independent video game developers. They can put the game there, they sell Steam that is bad, retains a, a part, okay? And I think that this is great because most of the people playing here, or a lot of the people playing here, at least not the people that we can get in a museum, maybe, okay? So basically people playing here is US, Russia, China, Brazil, Germany are the main players, but the next one is like Philippines, Turkey. So we are reaching people that they are not usually rich. And sit to my top. So then I like the relevance of these non-traditional networks, okay? Because then we are reaching to people, it's not an academia, to work with them, but also is we reach what I call the rich. <clears throat> The ones that they don't come to us usually. Okay. I need to close. I'm sorry, I'm really over time. Uh, about the research context in ASU. So I have some ongoing collaborations. So with Susanna Neuer, we have this NSF going. Uh, we have graduate student there, Yuki Niimi, he's at BIOS for a year. Actually, he's TAing now remotely. 
but he's in the campus. We still have two years, and I hope that now that COVID is not as impactful, uh, we'll have a, a calm next two years. Uh, I was talking to Gillian uh, Gill today also. She's part of the ISU, ISU faculty. I'm trying to help her grad student because her dissertation got impacted by COVID. So it's a different than a small data set I have. And also, uh, Nicole might come to BIOS this summer uh, with a BIOS grant in aid. This is a small award that is going to cover all the expenses that she has in BIOS. So hopefully, we'll see Nicole coming this summer. But other things that I would like to happen. So we are very short in diverse collaborations. We are just ethnographers. So easy things, engineers to do things like the ROVs that we designed with people from Rhode Island. Machine learning, I have a student right here he goes because I'm trying to understand why it's so difficult to identify some plankton. Also, this is something big, but I'm trying to create a mirror in the US for that web tool to host all the federally funded grants by federal rules by NASA, for example, they cannot host the data in this place because the, the computer is physically in Europe and it cannot be out of the US. But we don't have manpower expertise. And then I've been talking, I was in a meeting I think in December with NSF, NOAA, and NASA program directors. And they liked the idea, but they asked me where. I was like, I don't know. Because none of them, they wanted to have to throw it into our people. And then I'm, I'm wondering if ASU could improve our position and if it could be something that ASU would be interested in hosting. This is this from NOAA, all the federally funded uh, from NSF or from NASA programs. So this is important for monitoring of the oceans, etc. Other things I'm doing physically in Bermuda and has implications for management, but we don't have any sociological or policy maker components in our grants. And I think that has been analyzed in the past uh, of not getting the grants. And we have a lot of data from grants and, and we, have, we have students apart from the ones that we saw from collaborators. And they, that way we are losing our intellectual merit because basically it's somebody else's students from France or from the Netherlands who is doing the, out, the, the papers. And, and we love to have students, I mean, today. <laughs> so we can analyze better all the grants that we have all the data. And with that, uh, apologies for the five minutes extra. And um, just thinking of the funding sources from the European, when we were still part of Europe, we were able to have European funds. All right. Thank you. Did I talk too fast again? You a great talk. Thank you. So thinking about the future from the data that you have. So would it be possible to develop models, given that you know about how those various plankton species migrate to different environmental spaces to predict what might be a future composition of the sole plankton under conditions of ocean warming or other changes? That is what we are trying to do. But oh. This is the, the spirit of our grant. We, we cannot reach to that point because the PIs in that grant will have that expertise. We're trying to indicate under which environmental conditions we have what behaviors. But that was the spirit of the grant. And I think that we said that we'll contact modelers <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, there are some to... here around. Exactly. But this is one of the power that we'll have if we can find then the next step up. And that will be not only our data, there's a lot of data available that NAVA is trying to do that because that is the, that is the next step. How we can, our data is very good because it's very complete. Yeah. That means we have the images and we have very good hydrographic characterization. of have data from surface to 1000 meters deep that that's very uncommon to have. No, no, that, that's impressive. Just a technical question. What is PCA3? And so you just showed us the first two components that explain 77%. Yes. If you want to predict with this more accuracy into the future, we will have to figure out what it, what's in three and four. Yes, so I think that it is still being significant. Was PCA4 was significant still or not? But in PCA3, actually, you have a lot of transparency, but even less size is real. Because in this one, you see that size yes. is still 
also aligned with, with PCA2. So that it transforms in, in transparency. And actually, there are more interesting things there because actually in that one up appears a group that actually I'm very interested in. That is a different, it's a, a, a whole family that they are specialized in actually staying horizontal in the water steady mm -hmm. with very um, feathery appendices. And actually they're capturing everything that is passing by. So yes, there is a PCA3 that is also very interesting. But I mean, this is reducing what yeah. you represent. Yeah, try to visualize three dimensional. No, and or, or the, how do you present? How do you explain four dimensions in that? Yes. Well, I want to say that we don't we don't at this time have any questions online, and we are actually one minute away from from finishing. But this is a great opportunity for me to speak loudly, so everyone online can hear and say that you will have a faculty forum at three o'clock where folks can drop in and. If anyone in here hasn't had a chance to ask a question, that's another opportunity. Um, and that um, Leo will be around yeah. uh, as well. So. And if you send me the, and the questions, I will try to answer them yeah. later by email. Absolutely do that. Do you want? I had a quick one, but we only have a minute. I can talk to you. OK. It's a it's a nerdy one. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you should ask a nerdy one. <laughs> it was just curiosity for metabarcoding since you're working on animals and I'm used to working with unicellular organisms. We have a big problem with a uh, copy number with the marker gene that we use influencing the abundances that we see from metabarcoding approaches compared to like cells. I just was curious how that plays out in in zooplankton and animals as they're multicellular as are, how, how do they correlate is it good for numbers of organisms versus reeds or is it terrible no, there are many things there um <laughs> my, my my theoretical take to that and it's a bit complex to explain is that copy number is going to follow a natural distribution mm -hmm. and i would like to think that every time that we randomly substitute or randomly like we substitute the species the species that come after actually they're going to follow in this kind of neutral theory Actually, not affect the the natural the the normal distribution. So then, what we can think is that we are seeing changes this in the relative abundance of the animal related to itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so you have sure. ten more. Relative you are going to have ten more of it. Sure. If this is moving from ten to one to a hundred or hundred to a thousand, we don't know. However, every paper that I've seen, they have tried to relate biomass to copy number to to reads mm -hmm. or to uh, relative at, at reads they have find always high correlation okay i was like, wondering if that was true for like, multicellular organisms yeah, also extremely high yes okay mm -hmm. and there are some interesting things for example copy posts they have a fixed number of cells mm, okay they don't have mitosis also so once they're adults they don't do mitosis anymore Wow. Whatever they have, they have. <laughs> so and they have a fixed number of, of cells. After you see a larger copy pot, it's not they have more cells because their cells are going to be larger. They want within the same species. Wow. Within the same species, the, the number of cells is fixed. Right, right. So that that facilitates yeah. a lot. Yeah. Or because then that's the matter you have. Yeah, a, that makes a big difference. I was imagining there would be so many different no, sizes no. So, and so cell within, numbers. Within, and... The, within the species, the number of cells. Okay. And that facilitates a lot. Cool. Those numbers. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.